Well, uh, good morning. It's good to be here. Um, we're going to talk today about some more mystery, and it's going to be great. Uh, I can't agree more with uh, what Heath said about the mystery of the gospel and how uh, we've got to lean into it and not run away from it. We don't need to quantify and understand everything uh, because some of the beauty of our faith lies in its mystery. <clears throat> in fact, I've, I've uh, said this to my students several times. Um, what, uh, this is not a joke. It's actually just a, a thoughtful question. Uh, think about all the disciplines we study in school, right? All the different subjects. If you need to picture a, if you're old enough like me, picture a trapper keeper and all of the, you know, the little divisions. And which of those uh, disciplines of study is the, is religious study the most similar to? And a lot of answers are out there. Usually PE is not in the mix, but maybe. But you get history. Sometimes uh, you get language, uh, language studies um, uh, and so forth. Sometimes you get science if you really go in that, into that camp. But I always uh, feel, I, I rarely get this answer, uh, that the closest subject in school that religious studies uh, is akin to is art. Art. Performing art, visual art. And the reason is because art, like our faith, is a concrete expression of an abstract reality. Right? Trying to put into form that which is transcendent of form. And so that's why a lot of times when our faith gets articulated, it comes out mysteriously. And we're going to see some of that in one of the most mysterious books in the entire Bible. That's the book of Revelation. But first, a story, a couple stories for you. Some years ago, it's a while back now, I got a phone call that nobody ever wants to get. A friend of mine, I was told, this is far away from where I was, so that's why I got the phone call. A friend of mine was terribly ill and was at the hospital. Now, he'd been ill for a long time, and so hospital, hospital admissions were not that unusual for him. So I was kind of like, okay, he's, I get it. He's in the hospital. And they helped me understand. The person on the phone helped me understand this time was different. He said his body is failing him at a, a new level uh, and in a way that the doctors aren't sure if they can stop. I said, are you, are you saying he might not make it? And the answer, of course, was, yeah, he might not make it. So I hung up the phone, and I did the only thing that I could do living far away, um, which was to pray. So onto my knees I went. I didn't do that very often, but I thought, well, I'll show God that I mean it. <laughs> and, and it was tile floor, too, so I really meant it. It was. Uh, so I said something along these lines. This is the argument that I built for God. <laughs> I said, Father, you are the creator and sustainer. Uh, no one loves my friend more than you. Your word says that if you are willing, you can heal the sick. And you know that healing, my friend, would be such a miraculous witness that hundreds, maybe thousands of people will come to you as a result when they hear this story. And so, please heal my friend in Jesus' name. It seemed convincing to me. Solid argument, right? Uh, in fact, I really couldn't think of a good reason why God wouldn't take this opportunity to be glorified in this healing. But if, if you can sense the foreshadowing, uh, not long after I got another phone call that sure enough, my friend did not make it through this particular bout. He passed away. Okay. Now right here, I could stop and say, we're going to talk today all about prayer and what do you do and how do you deal with the prayer where, when your answer to your prayer is no. But that's not really where I want to go with this. I don't want to just focus on the outcomes of our prayers um, and I'm going to show you that I don't want to just talk about it, particularly when the answer is no, by giving you another quick anecdote, another true story, where the outcome was quite different. Okay, so a couple years later, I paced back and forth, just like I am now. Maybe that's why I was pacing. I paced back and forth in a room, all alone, door shut, uh, in a, a meeting room in this church in Belfast, Northern Ireland, where I happened to be living at the time. And I was going to lead the youth group that evening. And in, the, in this case, the lesson was on forgiveness, and I felt really called, really uh, compelled to make that invitation to the, to the kids. That invitation to finally, once and for all, say they were going to follow Jesus with their lives. Right? The, the evangelical call. Now, you need to know this about me. I believe in that, and it's important, and I answered that call and so forth. But I'm not, I don't do that very often. So it was, I was scared. I was kind of nervous. 
And I was like, this is very not Mike-like to be like, everybody come to Jesus. It was just kind of a foreign to me, and so I was nervous. So I did the thing that I knew to do, which was to pray. So a door closed, and I said something along the lines of, Father, I can't ignore the fact that you seem to want me to ask these kids to make a commitment to follow you tonight. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared that it's going to be embarrassing, that no one will come. Um, but that's worldly of me. Uh, this is your gig. Please bring them to you. But that's, my, that's the desire of my heart. Please bring them to you. There it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I told the kids that uh, after the lesson, I'd be upstairs. We had this upstairs room, me and another leader. And I said, listen, we'll be praying no matter what. So if you don't come upstairs, don't feel guilty because we're going to be praying anyway. Okay? No wasted time. Uh, but if you feel compelled to come upstairs, do so. And we'll be there and we will pray with you through that. And so we pray, and, and I hear quiet for a, for a while, and then I hear the kids starting to talk downstairs, because youth group was over, you know, so you get that kind of visiting uh, murmur. And in my back of my mind, as I'm praying, I'm like, okay, I get it, you know. And then I hear footsteps up the stairs. And I look over, and there's a teenage uh, girl standing in the door in tears. And she comes in, and we prayed with her, and she made her commitment uh, to follow Jesus with her life. And I thought, that was awesome. Thank you, Lord. And I got up to kind of, ah, oh, wow, that was a great night. And I looked over and there was another kid standing in the door. And then another. And then another. Four kids in a relatively small, small youth group uh, for that night made an outward profession of their faith. And as far as I know, are still following Jesus to this day. Okay? So another instance of praying for people, but this time with a very different outcome. Now, I tell you those two stories, again, not so much to start broaching the topic of answered versus unanswered. I really want to get away from that today, because when we talk about prayer, that's almost always what preoccupies our mind, right? Okay, prayer, answered, unanswered. You know, is it gonna, am I going to get my way or not? Am I going to get my way or not? But we've got to be able to look at prayer before that, perhaps. Beyond it? Not sure. So I look at those today. Because experiencing those different outcomes, especially when we pray for someone else, is frustrating, not so much because we sometimes don't get our way, but for a very deeper and theological reason. And this is it. Why should we pray at all if God is basically going to do what God wants to do? Even when we believe that what God wants to do is the right thing to do. Even when we believe that, it still begs the question, okay, why should I step in? Now, this kind of prayer, when you pray for someone else, is known as intercession. It comes from the word intercede, which means to go between. So picture kind of a triangle, right? There's God here, and there's someone over here who has a need, and you step in between, and you say, Lord, I want to bring you this person and this need. That is called intercession, okay? Um, so back to my anecdotes, I interceded for my sick friend. I interceded for the youth of the church and I had a vested interest in those prayers, you know, so you could try to argue cynically that it was, it really was about me at the end of the day, but I really don't think it was because even though I had a vested interest in it, I wasn't the one in the hospital and I wasn't the one trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be a Christian. I really was praying for them and on their behalf. Okay, but when again, when we see those varying outcomes, the question becomes, why do it? Was it worth it? Is there a point? Okay, now to be more theologically grounded than just I pray to get what I want, consider this. And I and I say this again, not to be like. Not to be unduly argumentative with myself, but just to point out that it's a, it's a good and theologically informed question. Why should I pray when God has a will already? Okay? The disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray, and he does. And he teaches them a prayer that we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. If you come from a Catholic background, you may have heard of this as the Our Father. Same prayer, basically. Okay? It starts, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy... Anybody? Thy will be done. So they said, teach us to pray. Jesus said, okay. And he taught them to pray that, among other things. So again, if we're supposed to pray for God's will to be done, if we're supposed to conform our will to God's will, then what is the role of our intercession? Does it have a part to play and what is it? 
In other words, why don't we just say, dear God, get her done. Amen. The 930 service, someone actually applauded that idea. They were like, yeah. Out of here. So, and if anybody out there is especially astute, you're wondering right now, I thought we were talking about heaven. What's up with the prayer stuff? Well, you're right. And we are going to talk about heaven, okay? We've been talking about heaven for the last two weeks. We've learned in week one, heaven, uh, that we were created for eternity. In fact, all of creation was created for eternity. God didn't just say, I'm going to make this amazing thing and then burn it all up. Okay? Last week, Pastor Aaron talked to us about how um, God created the world to have shalom or perfect harmony and peace. And he has every intention of completing that shalom. And so we remember that the narrative of Scripture begins, I keep looking over at the stained glass, it catches my eye on a sunny day. It begins with this perfect creation, and it ends over here, let's say, with perfect creation. And that the cross actually comes in the middle out of necessity. Whether or not God planned it from the beginning, the way we experienced it is, sin interrupts God's great creation. It disturbs it, right? Right? It warps it. And Christ comes to conquer it and offer us a promise that God will indeed have his way in the end. That there will be no more tears. There will be no more death. So this is the interim. We live in between the two times, right? The church is given new life. But what are we supposed to do before it's completed? So the name of the sermon is Heaven's Vocation Starts Now. Vocation comes from the word, uh, which means to call. Heaven's calling upon us begins now. We don't just sit and wait for heaven to be fulfilled. I'm going to read to you from Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, In this letter, we're going to get a glimpse of what our prayers actually don't so much look like as sound like. Uh, From a heavenly point of view... We're going to also look in a little bit at Revelation to get a heavenly perspective on prayer. So if you have your Bible with you, we're going to read from Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 27. It's also going to be on the screen. Follow along with me if you would. We know, Paul says, that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So creation is groaning. We are groaning. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we're accustomed here to saying, This is the word of the Lord, and responding, Thanks be to God. Yeah, so let's go again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. So in the light of this scripture from Romans and a couple other images I'm going to share with you from Revelation, I'm going to give, well, scripture is going to give us three images, three ways of understanding what our prayers are. And I think that will motivate us to understand why they are worth praying. Right? And again, I can't say this enough, how much I want to steer us away from outcome. That's why I gave you the two anecdotes I gave you, different outcomes, right? So what our prayers are in a heavenly way, and therefore we'll understand better after, the, after we're done here, why it's worth praying them. Okay? And the images are these. First one, the groaning. It's actually less of an image and more of a sound, right? The groaning. Uh, the second, the throne of God upon which Jesus and Jesus alone can sit and mediate. And finally, the smoke of incense rising up before the throne. 
So the groan, the throne, and the smoke. Doesn't rhyme. I wish it rhymed, but I can't rewrite scripture. So what are you going to do, right? The groan, the throne, and the smoke. So let's start with the groan. Paul, we just saw, uh, describes what's happening when we cry out to God. In fact, we just sang it in ancient skies. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Creation cries, so will I, right? Creation groans and cries out, and we join in that crying out. Okay, now, it's good. that groaning means a few things. First, probably it means we long for something that we don't yet see or have or, or experience, right? Things are not the way that they are supposed to be. It's hard to watch the news and walk away going, yeah, no, things are great, right? Now, obviously, we all have our worldview, okay? But there's a, a professor of religious studies at Boston University, a well-known author, one of my favorite authors, Stephen Prothero, and he argues that all religions really, and really I'm going to add most philosophies, they all identify a problem with the world, or the really big philosophies, a problem with existence itself. And if one were to say, well, not all of them, then my answer is, then why does it exist? The religion or the philosophy just doesn't need to be there at all if there's truly nothing wrong. And so Prothero, and I agree, says, no, we all, from our varying perspectives, look at the world and go, something is not quite right. Okay? Christianity, of course, sees this problem as sin, that which separates us from God, either by nature or by choice. Okay? Now, Dr. Neil Plantiga, when it comes to choice, he describes sin as culpable, which means that stuff we're responsible for, culpable disturbance of God's shalom. He even calls it vandalism of God's shalom, like walking over the stained glass window and just spray painting all over it. Yeah, it's a visceral, hard image to swallow. Now, of course, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see the conquering of that sin. We see the first fruits of the new creation already begun. And that's why when we look at the world, we, we groan and long and don't even have the words to express what's wrong with this world. And it's painful, especially as Christians. We live in an in-between time. We believe that, again, on the cross and in the resurrection, God has begun this new creation that we hear about in Revelation. But we look at the world and say, well, clearly it is not yet complete. And so we live in a painful paradox that many people refer to as the already, but not yet. The already, but not yet. And that longing for the completion of God's kingdom is expressed through our and creation's groans. Okay? So that's our first image, the groaning. Good news is that the groaning is not only just a longing for what we don't have, it also expresses our hope. I don't know about you, but when I hope for something, I don't usually, you know, groan for it. But Paul uses the image of childbirth, and it's a good one. Uh, because what is childbirth if not a painful experience that is nevertheless worth it because of what it represents? Right? Uh, the, the woman is willing to go through it, because she wants the child to be born. And so the groaning is painful, but it's also hopeful. That's why Paul says, in this hope, we are saved. He doesn't say, despite the groanings, we can still hope. No, he says, we groan with creation, and in that hope, he actually equates the two. So the groaning expresses a longing for things to change for the better. It also expresses a hope that they will change for the better. You could also say it like this. If you truly had no hope, why would you bother groaning, right? So the groaning expresses longing and hope. And finally, now this is in the more heavenly realm, it expresses God's own love and desire for the same thing. That's why the Holy Spirit also steps in, when, especially when we don't have the words, and is willing to groan on our behalf. Dwell in that image for a while today or this week. And I, I ask you this, if you ever needed an image of God's love, besides the cross, which we know is sort of the supreme 
image, if you need a new, another one, imagine that God says, I not only hear your prayers, but I will step in and pray for you when you can't. That's grace. So that's what the groaning shows us. That's what our prayers are when we bow our heads and say, Dear Lord, will you please help? And so forth. A groaning, a longing, a hopefulness, and a love of God that he would say it's worth it anyway. Now that's the first, the groan. The next one rhymed with it. You remember it? The throne. Yeah. So I'm going to read just a smidgen from Revelation. By the way, I was scared of Revelation for years. (laughs) Yeah, kind of open it and be like, yeah, dragons, ugh, scary. Close it up again. And then, I, uh, and, then, and then I was asked to teach a class on it. I was like, you got the wrong guy. I'm scared of that book. Um, but I read a book about it and taught the and, and it's nothing to be afraid of, okay? So it's a lot of mysterious imagery, but it's really, really awesome. So let me read a couple of images for you from the book of Revelation. Chapter 5, verse 8, it says this. The lamb is, is taking the scroll from God's hand on the throne, Okay. And the elders fall down in worship of the Lamb, holding a harp in one hand and golden bowls full of incense on the other. The important thing here, we're going to get to the incense, is that the Lamb of God, who appears to be slain, is seated at the center of the throne. And the people cry out, the elders and the angels, all the heavenly beings cry out, who can open the scroll of God? Who can know what God wants and what God is doing No one is worthy to do so. And then John sees the lamb on the throne and he takes the scroll. And when he takes it, they worship him saying, worthy is the lamb. Right? That song, if you know it. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Right? He is the one. The lamb, of course, going back to when Jesus was baptized, John the Baptist sees him and says, look, the lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. The lamb here, obviously, is Jesus himself. And so when we imagine the throne of God, when it comes to prayer, we have to remember that we have a mediator, someone who can communicate to God and communicate God to us in a very unique and powerful way, and that is, of course, Jesus himself. No wonder Paul tells his young pastor, Timothy, to make intercession and pray and petition God for all people. First Timothy chapter two, he says, be praying, be praying, pray, pray, pray for the people. Why? Because there is a God and there is a mediator to that God, the man, Jesus Christ. That's why the book of Hebrews says we have a great high priest, one who mediates between us and God. No, it's not the priest at the local church. Not even the Pope, but the only great high priest, Jesus himself, who truly mediates to the throne on our behalf. Okay? And that's why we can be so confident when we pray. In short, in this life, we may never be nearer to the throne of God than when we are in prayer. And I think I should note, it's totally inextricable counterpart, which is worship. Prayer and worship always go together, right? So when we pray and worship, we approach the throne of God because it is being mediated to us by the only one who can, the only one who is both God and human. So our groaning is an expression of our prayers to God and God's love for our prayers. The throne of God is where we express our prayers and how through the mediation of Jesus. And our third image, the groan, the throne, the smone, no, the smoke, the smoke of the incense. This one I love because it switches the perspective, right? It's not just us praying to God. What's it like for God? What does God experience when we pray? And that's where the smoke of the incense comes in. Twice Revelation gives us an image of our prayers as the smoke of the incense. Revelation 8 goes into a little bit of detail. It says this, as Jesus is just about to open the seventh seal of the scroll, another angel has a golden censer, which is a thing that holds incense, censer, incense. A golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given a lot of incense to offer along with the prayer, prayers of God's people. On the golden altar 
in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Okay, the smoke of the incense went up before God from the angel's hand. The Old Testament gives us some imagery of prayer as rising incense, but only once that I could find, Psalm 142. Actually, the psalmist asks God to receive his prayer as though it were incense. But way more frequently in the Old Testament, we see incense being used not so much as a symbol for prayer, but as a fragrant and pleasing offering to God, a gift to God, as it were, right? And one that is pleasing to, for him. Okay? So our prayers here, depicted as the smoke of the incense, tells us that when we pray, and remember, I'm not even going to the outcome of our prayer, but this, the prayer itself is a pleasing and fragrant offering to the God who loves us so much that he's willing to even give us his attention. And why wouldn't our prayers for others be pleasing to God? Why wouldn't they? Isn't God the one who intercedes on our behalf? Isn't God the one who gave his only begotten son so that we might have life? When we reflect that love through our prayers for others, it pleases our Father in heaven. And it model, or it follows the model that Jesus gives for us when he prayed for us. I don't know if you knew that, that Jesus prayed for us. John records it in chapter 17 of his gospel. Father, Jesus said, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory and the glory you've given me, because you've loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus prayed that we would be with him. And one of the ways we are with him is through prayer. So I opened with two uh, anecdotes about intercessory prayer with very different outcomes. And I led to that question, so why bother? Why pray at all? Now we've seen three great images that I hope tell us a little more about what prayer is as our heavenly calling uh, and motivate us to go ahead and do it. It is a groaning that expresses longing and hope and love. It is a drawing near to the very throne of God, and it is a pleasing offering in God's presence. That's why Paul says, only two sentences after the scripture I read that was on the screen, chapter 8 of Romans, we are being conformed to the image of the Son of God. In other words, when we pray, especially when we pray for others, we look more like Jesus. We look more like Jesus. When we pray for the world, and most certainly, and this is a sermon for a different day, when we act out our love for the world in action, we more fully reflect the image of God with which God originally created us. We draw ourselves and the world nearer to the shalom which God intends for his world. Violence approaches peace. The storm begins to calm. The world sheds, perhaps, one tear Fewer than it did yesterday. In fact, I think I'm going to make that my prayer for the week. Lord, may the world shed one tear fewer today than it did yesterday. Move us towards your shalom. God invites us to be a part of that work. And I'll finish with a quote from N.T. Wright, who we've heard a lot from. He says this. We have glimpsed in Jesus the new creation coming to birth. We have felt something of its power by the Spirit in our own lives. And it has given us the immense privilege of sharing the intimate life of the triune God himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us share together with God his very life and his very intention for the world that we are going to call heaven someday. Let's start now. Let's pray together. Will you bow your heads with me and pray? <sighs> Living God, your scripture is overwhelming to us. Its richness and its imagery, its sounds and its smells. 
they take some time to sink in. But thank you for arriving here, very present within and among us, that our prayers would indeed rise up to you as a fragrant offering, and that we would answer our vocation, answer our heavenly call to join you in your work, to join you in your love by praying for the world around us. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for heeding us. And thank you for this time together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.